Please. Two. Good. Yes. One. Welcome, Shasta. We Thank were just you. talking about your your cascading beautiful hair, and I thought it was a, a fun Thank conversation you. to jump. I feel on. I feel like we're in a group of great hair, and that is a rare occasion, and we ought to celebrate it to the max. I think big that hair, great. Big hair, big spirits. We're out there. Big fire sign energy. Yes, maybe? Sagittarius. Oh, okay. And my moon is mm -hmm. in Aries, lots of fire. Yeah, my moon's in Gemini. That's a weird one. But you got mm. a Sagittarius and Aries and a Sagittarius with an Aries moon. Shasta Justin, thank you so much for joining us today. We it's a you're you're like the most hilarious person we've ever met. Not only do you have a new book coming out, but you're also um in the real world sort of I don't know, space slash sector that Diana and I are in, in reality TV. So we actually know you. We've known you for a little while now. Yes, you have. And I'm very sorry about that for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've all cascaded around the same conferences. We pitched to the same people. We're in the same, you know, slog here sometimes. So we relate to one another. And then it's interesting, just like Lexi and I found out we had a serious interest in spirituality and consciousness that you do too, in I a do. different manner. But it's interesting that here we are collecting together on a on another level. A spiritual plane. A, definitely. The spiritual, a spiritual plane. plane. Yes. yes. In the year 2024, when this is supposed to be our year. Right. We're going to elevate everyone in this conversation. It's a year of the awakening. I hope so. So where do we want to start? Oh my gosh, because Shasta, we will just talk and laugh for hours as usual. Um, when we used to see you at the conferences, there, there would just be like a group of like 50 people laughing and then you in the center holding court. I mean, to be around Shasta is to laugh your ass off, have an amazing time, and meet a really amazing, honest, genuine friend. So you, do you want to, where should, where do we start, guys? Where do we start with Shasta's book? Do you want to, yeah. Diana, where do you think we should start? Why don't we, why don't we dive into, since this is also the year of exposure, uh, so I felt like when I tapped into your book a little bit, I was like, oh, this is interesting. And uh, there's a little bit of anger in it and a little bit of, um, you know, a different, you're shining a different light on this corner of Hollywood that not too many people know about, think about, and it all looks magical and easy and fun, but you really kind of dive in there and, and you without any concern for your own safety you know tell us what it's all about yeah um so my book is called how i almost made it in hollywood but didn't half truths and misassertions about how to break into film and television and why you shouldn't um so it, it's interesting how it, it the idea for the book started out um, you know, as you both do, I had a lot of people outside the industry wanting to break in who would ask me 10,000 questions, you know, and, and they would be repeated questions every new person. And of course, I'm the sucker that will answer them. <laughs> I'll spend 30 minutes and go, I'll answer your questions. So <clears throat> I was talking to an, a book editor friend of mine and she said, you know, why don't you just do an FAQ, put an FAQ on your Facebook page or wherever, just so people have, can, can have some of the most common questions answered. And I was like, yeah, you know what, I can do that. And I thought it was going to be like a 10 page PDF that people could just look up. But every day after a long day of slogging it in Hollywood, I would, you know, sit down with my glass of wine and start writing. And it just became such a venting pleasure in a way, um, like all the things I'd like to see changed or what I would mm -hmm. advise newbies about um, who are trying to break in. And within a month, I literally had the first draft of a book and mm -hmm. I, I couldn't believe it um, because I wasn't expecting that to happen. Um, of course, then there's the edit, which takes <laughs> years 
while you're doing other things. It's, it's you know, writing the first draft isn't as hard as, as the edit, um, which I'm still finishing up last notes on. But what I wanted to do <clears throat> was write the kind of book that I wish I had had mm -hmm. before I started off in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. What are the things that I wish I had known so that I wouldn't have made the many, many mistakes that I did make? And, you know, I know that people think, on the one hand, Hollywood is incredibly unforgiving on the other hand it's very forgiving because for someone like me to come in and make so many mistakes and have people forgive them or help me out um it shows a level of um generosity and people don't really think of hollywood and generous in the same sentence but it certainly can be and there are certainly good people there are lots and lots of mm -hmm. good people lots there of good people lots of good people who just want to be creative, who want to make content, who love the art form. And Hollywood, you know, so much of it, 90% of it is a business that people forget that the reason people like us are attracted to Hollywood is for the creativity, is for the talent, is for the art of it. We didn't really come here to be business people, most of us. We came here to be creatives. And um, the structure of, of Hollywood is that 90% of it is a business. So then you get, you know, pulled into doing the business side of it. So and as an outsider, you know, I didn't go to film school. Um, my path was very different. I started off in professional theater. Um, I did that. I did an undergraduate degree in English and women's studies, then a master's. I went on to a Ph.D., um, that I ended up uh, leaving because I had a baby. <laughs> but um, I always think like Margaret Atwood left her PhD, so it's fine, right? Um, it is fine. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you certainly don't need a PhD for Hollywood. But by the time I had gotten to Hollywood, you know, I was already an accomplished literary writer. I had written a book called Winter, the Unwelcome Visitor that was endorsed by a Nobel Prize winner. I had publications in different literary journals. I had academic publications, um, and, you know, my book ended up being on a top 10 list for poetry for Indigo Books. So um, I had quite a bit of, hmm. of uh, a history as a creative before Hollywood. And then one year, um, I had a close friend whose husband was an actor. And she was like, hey, you know, he really hasn't been in a show or anything for a while. Will you write something for him? And I think as a writer, um, I most certainly, if I'm inspired by someone, will write for them, which is, you know, a good tip for people, um, especially actors, to know that, you know, writers will write something for you if they find you inspiring or see you in a certain role. So I said, OK, well, let me think about it. And I came up with an idea and um, I submitted it to the Toronto Fringe Festival and by some like shock and surprise I got in I wasn't expecting to at all hmm. and then I was like oh my gosh I have to put on a production and it was a theater production it was called Love and Human Extinction it was uh one woman two men a love triangle at the end of the world um because I do I do love me some apocalypse and because you know the, yes! the question the question I had was okay you know they always say like oh, I wouldn't sleep with you if you were the last man on earth. And I thought, okay, but what if there were two of them? <laughs> what if there were two last men on earth and you were the only woman and you had to like pick or choose or decide what you were going to do? And so I put this character, Roberta, in this impossible scenario with Elliot, who's like this, you know, 40-year-old businessman and, and, and Andy, who's this 19-year-old you know, sort of Christian boy with with a gun who's a virgin who like doesn't even know anything about girls. And of course, they both fall in love with her. And then she has to kind of navigate the two of them um, in the apocalypse because there's just three of them. And of course, it goes downhill very quickly. Um, but anyway, so I, I wrote and produced it, you know, hired a director and I put on the production um, for the 2009 Toronto Fringe Festival. Mm -hmm. And it did really well. Like the festival wasn't even expecting it. I wasn't expecting it. I don't think anyone was. And um, a lot of film and TV people had come to see it. And then, you know, after shows, you go to bars and you, you drink there and you celebrate with your cast and crew and so on. And a lot of film and TV people came to me and they said, what are you doing in theater? Why aren't you in film and television? 
Now, it had never occurred to me in a million years to be in film and television. I mean, I'm Gen X. There was the era of no smartphones. You know, I hand wrote a lot of my papers in college for the first couple of years. We weren't even emailing. There was like no such thing as the internet. So it was a very different time for me to grow up in. And, you know, at that time, you had to have a ton of money to be able to put on to make a film or, or a TV series. And, you know, nowadays, like kids who are 15 are on their iPhones and they can, you know, it amazes me. You have like an entire studio in your iPhone. Like there really is no reason for people not to be making content right now. Like the people who sit around and go, oh, I can't make anything. Hollywood won't let me in. I'm like, you've got a, you've got a whole studio right in your, in your phone. Like that's amazing. So you know, and, and if I had had that as a teenager, my life might have turned out differently and I might have started there sooner. But I was very determined to become a literary writer. Like when I was 11, I wrote my first poem and it was so good. It's in the book, by the way. I had to publish it somewhere. 11 year old, po 11 year old me writing a poem. Um, and uh, but I was like, oh, I love this. This is easy. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to become a literary writer because it's easy. And I, I have to, like, I, I don't normally do this, but I have to pull out my easy button. So, come on. <laughs> I, so, I actually bought this. Do it again. Do it again. Do it again. Yeah. We need it. That was easy. That's awesome. So, I bought this. Because I'm very stupid and I think that a lot of things are going to be easy. And so, you know, so my lead actor said to me, I was like, oh, everybody's telling me I should make a film, but I don't know how. And he said, don't worry, it's easy. That was easy. Right. And so I made my first film because I thought it was going to be easy. And I mean, it was just, it was the craziest thing. I wandered around the city of Toronto. And I just told people, I said, hey, I'm going to make a film. Do you want to help me with this? And all kinds of people just jumped in, like industry professionals who'd been doing it for 30 years. And I think they thought I was funny. Like, I think they thought I was a bit of a lark that I was like, I was like, I've never made a film before. I have no idea what I'm doing. Who's in? And all of these <laughs> incredible people jumped in. The mayor of Toronto at the time even helped me with my film. Like, it was nuts. And so... Um, Huh. So I made this film called Swan Asleep. It's about three young men who produce date rape pornography for the internet until one oh falls my. in love with his victim. It's a comedy. Oh, no, I'm just joking. It's not a comedy. <laughs> I'm like, it's wait amazing. a minute. You're the only person who writes darker things than me. It's a comedy. Yeah, it's a comedy. Um, so, you know, obviously it, it wasn't very funny, but it was like a very serious issue that I felt as a woman and as a feminist that I wanted to address. Hmm. And that was sort of my way of doing it. So I made this film. I got an executive producer on board to come in with some money. I put in some of my own. I wrangled a team and I made my film. And it, it, it was such a weird length. It was 44 minutes which is like completely unprogrammable for film festivals, right? No, you can't. It still is. You can't because it's too long to be a short and it's not feature length. You still can't. Exactly. It, it was it. So, and no one told me, of course. So I didn't know what I was doing. And I met with this distributor and he was like, just cut it the length that you, that you think tells the story best with what you have. So that's what I, that's what I did. And the thing is, though, it ended up being such a great calling card because I took it around to different production companies mm -hmm. and executive producers. And they were like, oh, this is really good. What do you want to do with this? And actually, a distributor had um, even offered mm -hmm. to give me financing to turn it into a feature. Right. And I turned it down. <clears throat> Somebody kicked me, but I did. I we, turned we it are. Down. We're definitely kicking <laughs> yeah. you. Oh, We're hard. kicking you under the table. Really hard. Under the desk. You have uh -huh. no idea how much you should kick me for so many reasons. That wasn't just like the one deal I turned down like an idiot or, or screwed up. So, and that's why my book is so great because it talks right. about like my inexperience and why I said no to things. I mean, at that point, I was so burnt out making the film that the idea of going back in as a writer, director, producer, right. to make a feature length of something that I, that like 
emotionally almost killed me in the first place. I was like, mm. I don't know, we're going to do a feature. What I should have done is taken mm. the money, written the script and hired another director mm-hmm. to direct it. That would have taken yes. a lot of the suffering out of it. But of course that never occurred to me anyway. So I showed this around and, um, uh, one of the, I met with, I, I ran into this guy in the bathroom at Starbucks. I'm not kidding when I say this. <laughs> I was at Starbucks, I opened the bathroom. I thought it was empty, and, but no, there was, there was a man standing there. I, he, don't worry, he was fully clothed, he was just washing his hands. And, uh, you know, we did the whole, like, who's on first kind of, oh, I'm so sorry, and who, who are you, whatever. We got in line at Starbucks, and we just started chit-chatting. And it turns out that he was this producer for this really big production company. And I said, oh, that's so funny because I just put on this play. Maybe you heard about it because it had been in the Toronto Star as, you know, Mm -hmm. one of their pre-festival must-sees. He was like, yeah, I think I have heard about it. So I sat down and I pitched it to him without even knowing. As far as I was concerned, I was just sharing my excitement of the story. I wasn't trying to get anything out of it. And um, his very beautiful Eastern European girlfriend was there. And she was like, oh, this is so good. The romance, the tragedy. The bu-. She was like, she, she's like tapping him, tapping him. You have to make this. You have to make this. And, and, I, and I was like, what are y'all talking about? What do you, you know? What do you mean? And then he goes, OK, OK. You know what? I'd like to see a spec script. And so that's how I wrote my very first script in Hollywood was because I bumped into a producer in the bathroom and we accidentally talked about the show that I'd put on. And so I wrote my first script and uh, it was, but, so it was, it was a really wait, big. For, pro- yeah. for the folks back home, what's a spec script? This is so, an important thing for people to learn because none of us knew this when we got here. It's true. And it's in my book, by the way, even though it's boring, uh, most of my book is not boring, but I explain a thousand terms in the industry that I didn't know. It's so helpful. In fact, like I remember seeking out those types of books before I moved to LA. And even after I'd been here for a number of years, honestly, having those books to reference, it's so helpful and so important. And very much you're seeing sort of behind the curtain or how the sausage is made. And I think you touched on something too with how you successfully pitched this producer and it didn't at all come off as this like overly rehearsed pitch. Yeah. Do you go into pitches as well in your book? So I do a little bit. I actually think I'm going to write a second book to teach people how to pitch Right. because I feel like this first book was, is just like really a social protocol book. It's explaining Hollywood itself People don't even know, I call them silos, that there are really four silos in Hollywood. And they don't really touch that often. You know, you've got scripted content, unscripted content. Within unscripted, you have, you know, what people call reality TV, but it's much more complicated than that, and documentaries. Mm -hmm. And then on the scripted side, you have TV series, but you also have feature films. And those worlds don't touch as much as people think they do. Right. And the reason that I ended up in all of those worlds and got deals in all four of those arenas was simply because no one told me I couldn't. <laughs> so when I got into Hollywood and I was creating my own slate, I was just, you know, get optioning or writing or creating or working with other creators to create shows that I thought were good stories, regardless of the silo that they were in. That was really just my... My, my thought was like, well, if it's good, it doesn't matter. And that's how I got to explore all mm. four silos of Hollywood, because a lot of people just stay in one. They just stay in, you know, TV series or only films. I have a very good um, development producer friend that you both probably know who, who just pretty much does features. And she's fantastic at it. But she doesn't really do a lot of television. Do you know what I mean? Mm. So you kind of end up finding this your niche. Um, but I never picked one. Um, and I, thank you. Yeah, well, it was and, and, and maybe that's gonna, Well, maybe that's going to shift, though, because we're seeing the whole industry crumble, which is the other thing I wanted to say about yeah. your book is that nobody's addressed the documentary nonfiction world. We've, of course, because of Harvey Weinstein and all of that sort of stuff, we've gotten to see a lot of Hollywood crumble. 
and people are demanding different things. There's been so much money gone in that has, excuse me, has gone into streaming that isn't working out in some respects. So it's just interesting that you're shining a light on this corner that nobody necessarily thinks about. Thank you, Diana. And yes, I do think that Hollywood on some level is crumbling. I think that mm -hmm. the lockdowns had a lot to do with mm -hmm. that. I think we all know that. I personally had some shows um, that were greenlit at the beginning of lockdowns right. and offers. I had actually like, for me, the beginning of the lockdowns was the greatest part of my career. I had given 10 hard years, worked my ass off, built really strong relationships, came across as dependable and reliable to broadcasters. And so broadcasters were calling me and saying, what do you want to do? Like that is the most ideal point you can reach in this career as a creator. And so I was just like, you know, rolling in the laugh, like, woohoo, it's going to be the best year of my career. And I didn't expect, you know, I don't think anyone did, obviously, the lockdowns to happen. And mm -hmm. uh, the broadcasters immediately were like, hey, everything's on hold. Now, when they do that, you don't know what's going to happen. Because, you know, three months, six months, they could say, well, you know, our audience has changed. We don't even need your show anymore. Like, it's not, right. it's not a promise that... If they say pause, you can pause, but it's not a promise that then they're going to make that property anyway, because they're not beholden to you in any way. I say in my book, networks do not negotiate with terrorists. And it's true, right? Like you can't make any kinds of demands. You're really there at their behest. And that's because they're the ones with the money. And people don't right. seem to realize that. Like it's their money. They get to decide. I remember when. Who's the um, terrorist? Yeah, who's the terrorist? We are. Hello. <laughs> We're definitely not. Um. So so anyway, it was and and then I think like you know we've been hit by wave after wave of bad luck in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. We've had you know um, the writer strike, the actor strike. Iatsi's now talking about whether or not yeah. they're going to go on strike, and yeah. and that's really you know, painful and, and it really hurts the industry. It really hurts creators. I think also with the advent of AI and all the, the, the wanting to buy digital rights to, you know, actors, likenesses and, and images and so on. There's also this sort of clash between the creative world and the tech world that's happening in Hollywood. So Hollywood is really having a rough moment. Um, and maybe my book is timely for that reason, as people mm -hmm. are trying to decide creatively what to do in their careers. Do they want to come to Hollywood and, and try to break in? Or are there other avenues and platforms for them to take advantage of as, as creators? And that's kind of like part of what I'm trying to help people decide to do is how to make that decision. It's like, where, what path do you really want to take? If you want to go to Hollywood, great. Here's how you break in. But if after reading this book, you're thinking twice about it, well, then here are some other alternatives. So I'm just trying to give people sort of the gamut and the choices and just a very clear understanding of Hollywood um, so that they understand what they're, what they're getting themselves into. And don't get me wrong. I love Hollywood. Hollywood's been good to me. Right. But that doesn't mean that, you know, it's, it, it's going to work for everyone. Right. It's not necessarily going to be the be all end all and influencers and other creators have taken over the creative universe. And as you said, before we actually started this interview, anybody can be producing any sort of content they want to. You don't have to wait for a studio or you don't need to feel like you're completely shut out. Just go do your own thing. Cause, and the more you do it and the more you produce and the more you put out there, the better it is. Absolutely, Diane. I couldn't agree with you more. And, and the thing is, is like, you know, people always ask me, how do you get an agent? How do you get a manager? Blah, blah, blah. And as I say in my book, I'm like, they'll come to you when you're ready. Mm -hmm. They'll find you. Um, and, and I'm not talking about actors. It's very different for actors. But, you know, as a writer, creator, director, they'll come to you. You don't need to go hunt down an agent. Because, uh, Diane, as you're saying, show the work. Show mm -hmm. them what you can do. And a lot of online creators are showing the work. 
and Hollywood is paying attention to them. And a lot of them don't even want to do deals with Hollywood. You know, I ran into an agent, right? I ran into an agent who only represents YouTubers and social media influencers. And I said, how's it going? Because I'm thinking he's making like money hand over foot. And he was like, oh, Shasta, it's terrible. And I was like, what do you mean? And um, he said, well, here's the thing is that Hollywood wants to work with social media celebrities and, and influencers and creators. They don't want to work with Hollywood. Now, how? Yes. Oh, that's right. So interesting. Isn't that's that so interesting? interesting? And here's yeah, why the reason. sacrifice. You get Go to ahead. have direct. A- no, no. I, you get to have direct access to your audience. You can make whatever content you want to make. You're completely flexible. Look, I know this guy who's so funny. I mean, I don't know him personally, but I follow him online. Um, Reed Choi is his name. He's so funny and he's so lazy. Okay. He doesn't even like, you know, when he's playing his own girlfriend or a chick or something, he might put like a headband on. He's gotten so lazy. He doesn't use props. He just goes like, this is, this is me over here. Okay. This is another character. He's so lazy. He doesn't even change his clothes, but he's still so good and so funny. You can't resist it. There's a guy who like cleans up people's overgrown yards. Someone explain to right. me why I'm no, obsessed I've with No, I've been this. watching it. Are I'm you obsessed. kidding? I watch it all the time. He's got millions of viewers. He's got he people does. tracking him down, people telling him thank God. you, and then other people yelling at him for, for being on properties that he's cleaning up. But he's amazing. Yeah. I Sorry, mean, like, can you, can you imagine <laughs> oh, I don't know who this person yeah. is. Oh, I think, girl, I think he's in Michigan. Life. Yeah, yeah. I think he's, a, he's, a, but he goes, he finds properties. He's a yard guy. He's a gardener. So he f- sees properties that are completely overgrown that either have been abandoned or no longer occupied. And he cleans them up for the neighborhood. Doesn't ask for but anything. Does he, gonna... Right. So he doesn't ask permission. So it's sort of like jumping over a fence and feeding somebody's pets no, without so their permission. No, so he does ask they... for permission. He goes oh, okay, around good. to oh, the good. neighbors. He tries to contact the okay. city or whatever. And once he finds out that it's completely abandoned or the bank owns it and they don't care if it's a lawn's mowed or you know, it was a meth house, I don't know, um, yeah. then, he'll, <laughs> then he'll do it. But he always talks yeah. to all the neighbors and there's video of him asking. And the neighbors are always unhappy because there's obviously nothing they can do about it right because it's not their property so he goes in and does it and he does it for free as diana was saying and um people really love it it's fascinating to watch him and I, I like, why do more. you guys love it no just like what about him is compelling just from a are you emotionally invested in the people that he's helping or sort of in what he's doing and his mission like does it look really good because why are why are people watching this I don't know, Shasta, you tell me, but I feel I mean, like it's a social movement. I do. I feel like he's doing mm. a social justice in a way. And he and he's not necessarily even that interesting. It's just him no, and his he's guy not. And they, right. I would and never they're, cast they're him. Tools. None of us would cast him. We would no, cast him. We would him. never okay. cast this guy. Yeah, which but, is but it's which something is he what believes in. Yeah, yeah, he's authentic. I, I will say that. It's his yeah, authenticity. Authentic. Right. And he'll spend mm. the whole day or a day and a half. And he's got regular customers, you know, so he does this yeah. on his other time. And he goes in there with his weed whacker and his, you know, and his lawnmower, him and a buddy. And I mean, they go to town on these places and they look terrific when I they're think done. For me, it's like the saddest. It's like the Mary Kondo satisfaction, satisfaction. of seeing like mm. the, the, the before and mm-hmm. after. Look, I'm addicted to makeover mm-hmm. shows of any kind. And to me, mm-hmm. <laughs> this is like a makeover show. It's a house makeover okay. show. But I feel like... Um, this isn't something you could pitch for television. Can you imagine? No. Like, okay, no, so that's what I was trying to wrap my head around. Uninteresting like, how do I... guy yeah. finds houses that need to be cleaned up, and then he mm-hmm. does it. And mm-hmm. networks would be like, wow, you're crazy. Get the hell out of my office. I know. <laughs> right? right. Would, or like, what? Did you do a Zoom interview with him? Yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> Is so. he a celebrity? Right? Yeah. How, how many, many followers? followers? <laughs> how many followers? <laughs> <laughs> so so yeah but I I love that because there are so many accounts online there's a guy who makes little tiny terrariums and shows you how and I keep promising myself I'm gonna make a terrarium but I don't I just watch him do it yeah right and I love it he's authentically doing something so can we just have a really quick side 
bar about yeah. authenticity because yeah. I feel like the three of us, when we connected, we just, in a way, we're like all kind of that weirdo in our own way. And we just yeah. gravitated towards one another because it's like, okay, we are obviously like a little bit different than the rest of the pack. And, you know, 10, 15 years ago, that may not have worked in a person's favor in Hollywood part of the time. But I think where we are now, it's the perfect time to be unique and weird and be authentically you. I think that mm -hmm. in terms of marketing yourself, it's the only way forward. I would, I would agree. I, I was just, I'm going to give ourselves a plug here, Lexi. Lexi and I just started posting ourselves on YouTube because for the last two years, we're like, no, 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 no. We're not putting our faces out anywhere. We'll do these interviews, but when nobody gets to see us, it's a mystery. But then we got people saying, listen, we don't really believe you. So we want to be sure you're like human and we want to see your faces when you do these interviews. Especially because you're so gorgeous, your faces. I mean, I would put them everywhere. I'd plaster your face. No, but it's like, what if we're AI? It could be an AI. Oh, I, mean, I know we need okay. to talk about that. Yeah. I'm terrified. I'm terrified of the singularity show. Shasta, should I be? I'm terrified of when AI reaches its critical mass. That's a great question. I mean, if you want to get into transhumanism and Ray Kurzweil. So <clears throat> it's, it's interesting because people define the singularity in, in different ways. Um, and Ray Kurzweil, who's kind of the, the grandfather of futurism, um, predicted that the singularity would happen between 2025 and 2045. And oh. it's most, yeah. So we're right in it, girls. Ah! <laughs> hmm. So he said, um, and, you know, one of the ways to define the singularity is when um, robots technically achieve consciousness. That's just the most simple way that I would put it out there to the public. Right. There are books and books and books written on defining the singularity itself. But I would say that's that's like a fairly good one. And And some people go so far as to say, you know, when robots become autonomous and are making their own robots. So um, I think like, yeah, <laughs> repopulating. I mean, and you know, uh, there's, there's some that pretty scary videos. Yeah. Repopulating like as robots. After, after the, the humans are all killed. then they're Yeah. They're, they're definitely well. not going to want Sorry, or need yeah. us around. Yeah. I don't yeah. think they, they care about us or they will. Um, so, I mean, first of all, there's like debates about whether or not we'd have to define sentience and consciousness before we could even decide if a robot is sentient or conscious. Um, so I think, you know, there's a lot of debate on that. I was just on a discussion panel with, with NTD talking to an AI specialist who completely thinks that AI is not going to become sentient. Oh, it's just a bunch of data sets. It's fine. And I mean, I, I kind of feel like that's what everyone says before things go really bad. Like in every movie, there's like right. the one person, usually this, a man, right. saying, oh, this is fine. This is fine. Right. And then, you know, you always you always get the the woman like the Sigourney Weaver or, you know, in, in Terminator, you get Sarah Connor saying, no, it's not fine. It's not fun. Somebody listen to me. And of course, we're women. So we're gaslighted. Which is kind of like, you know, how I feel sometimes when I talk about this stuff. They're like, well, you're a chick. What do you know about AI and technology? And I'm like, I don't know. I've only been studying it my whole entire life. But okay. So I think like, you know, I think that there's a very... Here's the problem is I have talked... Uh, I don't want to mention names. I've talked to some famous people who work specifically with AI. Mm -hmm. And they'll say things to me like, well, Shasta, here's the thing. We're, we're not quite sure how it works. And I was like, what do you mean? And they're like, well, we kind of create these parameters. And then there's this like black box where it does things. And we're just not quite sure what it's doing. And then they've like created like different AI programs that start talking to each other in a language that we don't know. It gets scarier and scarier. I have, I have been to some places in the, and I have seen, I have eyewitnessed some things that AI is most certainly humans are not doing that is really kind of scary. Um, I, I feel like I should give you an example off camera <laughs> and I'll tell you a couple of the scariest ones. Um, but yes, so I think one of the things we have to ask ourselves as this technology moves forward is 
what does this mean to us who are human? What kind of future are we looking towards? Where is, where is the place of human beings and humanity in this future? And I think that, <clears throat> you know, so my film, Altered Humans, How Biotech is Changing Who We Are, tackles a bit of that question, particularly in biotech. And what I'm looking at in, in particular, because, you know, and everyone should know, um, when you put together a documentary property, it can take you many years. Like mm -hmm. I went down this like biotech because I didn't know, you know, I'm not a, a, a trained scientist. I had to teach myself so much biology and so on to even try to understand a lot of the medical papers and tech um, and papers I was reading and the technologies and then to source out experts in the field that really know what they're talking about. And they're, you know, like they're like, a lot of different experts. You have to figure out who's saying what, that that's true. So making a documentary is very hard is all I'm trying to say. And, but what I found in my deep dive into this research was there is one thing that kind of joins all of these technologies together, whether it's in, you know, biotech, big pharma, medical devices, um, Silicon Valley, your computers, everything. And that philosophy is a philosophy called transhumanism. And it's, and this is where we get to the spiritual part, because this is interesting, is that, you know, people think transhumanism is this new idea that emerged with technology itself, but it's not. It actually comes from the ancient Gnostics. So at one point in, yes, I know, right? Crazy. So at one point in, um, you know, as the Bible was being written and the Christian church was sort of consolidating, there was a rogue group of individuals and they were called Gnostics. And actually you can look up the Gnostic texts. They also wrote books that were not included in the Bible, which oh, is so fun. It's such a fun rabbit hole, the Gnostics. Yeah, it is really so fun. So I agree. I love it. And I follow some Gnostic groups because I always want to hear like the late, like what's the latest. And so, um, so the Gnostics are really interesting mm. because where Christianity saw one good God who, you know, is like our father created us and so on. And then there was Satan who was an angel who rebelled against God, you know, organized this, this massive rebellion, took a third of the angels with him to hell, yada, yada. The Gnostics believed that there were two entities, like two gods, basically, a good God and a bad God. And the bad God, they believed, which is, they believe is the Christian God, just to spell that out for anyone who doesn't know, is trapped us, hum trapped us sort of like infinite souls into these fragile, frail human bodies that, that die. And they felt very angry and offended by this. And then they believe there was another entity, a good God, that wanted to give us freedom, freedom from form, in fact, our human form. And so the Gnostics, and it's, it's you know, it's, it's a religion or, or a group of ideas that keeps emerging periodically throughout human history. Mm -hmm. So the Gnostics really believe <clears throat> that we should become our own gods, that we should break with the reality and strictures of the natural world. And this is where technology comes in. So they are obsessed with things like longevity. They want to live forever. So when you hear them talk about, well, let's upload our consciousness to a computer, it's because they want, they, they want to live forever. They want these technologies, the fountain of youth, right? A lot of the Gnostics went into, got into, they were searching for the fountain of youth. A lot of early alchemists were actually Gnostics as well. Um, and then, but, but it's gone way beyond like just improving our lives, making us sort of like healthier and look young for longer. Hey, if I could have my 20 year old body till I'm a hundred and then die at a hundred, that, that would be great. I'm not gonna, that's like fun times. But I think the problem is, is that when they say, when, when, I mean, well, people have to ask themselves if it's a problem, is the denial of nature and reality. So you're getting your GMOs, you're getting um, terraforming of the planet, 
you're getting poisonous materials like glyphosate. So what they want to do is augment literally everything. They want to ch- they want to eliminate reproduction altogether. Actually, they don't want women as part of the equation. They want to grow babies in vat in va- in vats vats. They want to grow babies in vats. Like their ideal world. If you've read a Brave New World, that's where they want. That's that's exactly the vision that they're going for. And uh, I hate to say this, but but women are not really part of that equation. So they really think like, you know, you can become a cyborg or you should be able to upload your consciousness. You should be free of this human body or you should be a chimera. So in 2020, China announced publicly that um, they were making human pig chimeras. And I'll tell you why they're doing it, because they said, well, they have no human rights, so we can harvest their organs. Mm -hmm. No problem. So now we start getting into all kinds of <clears throat> ethical dilemmas. You know, I got into an argument th- with this one guy who was like, well, I don't care if my daughter was dying and needed an organ transplant. I would take this human pig hybrid organ and give it to my daughter. And I'm like, yeah, but that, that creature is still half human. Like, what do you mean? Like, that, like, d- like, how can we, can we really do these kinds of things? So innumerable ethical problems we are facing a time where there are so many ethical issues around biotech in particular but technology in general as we are facing in hollywood right now the three of us very directly in our careers Mm -hmm. that we have to start asking the question of like what is human what what do we want for humanity what are our shared values what are the values that we share? Or are we going to kind of let, you know, Dr. Frankenstein run amok and, cre- and, and go wild and create all these kinds of experiments with no regulations or, or ethical boundaries? And in the United States, I will say, we do have a lot more regulations than we do in the rest of the world, but that doesn't mean these things aren't being done. So, I, so anyway, but transhumanism, uh, if you watch my film, Altered Humans, I really get into what it's about in detail and also some of the technologies that have been created and the kinds of medical harms that they can inflict on people. And I'm very, very interested in medical harms. I don't care about the politics or self-identities or whatever. That's fine. You do you. But what I am very worried about is all of this experimentation on people. Um, and, And we actually had a young woman in the film who talked about how she was experimented on for a rare disorder that she had and some of the consequences of that. So we really, you know, I love some of these ideas because they're so great when you're reading it in a book and it sounds like philosophically amazing, like, like, you know, wouldn't it be great if we could have like perfect equality? Because a lot of transhumanists really do want equality, right? Like they're like, well, we see the world is very unequal. And so I know what we can do. We can, we can try to create a world that is equal. And then therefore everyone's the same and has the same opportunity. Unfortunately, you know, this is Lexi and I were texting um, yesterday and we were talking about like some of the harsh realities of Hollywood and also just life in general. Mm-hmm. There are harsh realities of the natural world. There are harsh realities of Hollywood. And I, and I think that I love science fiction so much. And, and I love thinking about all these interesting ideas, but I love them as fiction. I love them as fiction. And I'm not saying get rid of technology. Hey, let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. I absolutely don't want to do that. Let's just wash the baby. You know, like, let's clean up the baby. Let's have good, healthy technologies that make human beings live better and longer lives. I think that, I think there's an upper limit. I mean, unless, you know, talk about Enoch in the Bible or whatever, who knows? But, you know, I think, <laughs> but I, I think I, I'm down with like, the fountain of youth. I'm sorry. I'm a sucker. Yeah. No, sure. I'm, I'm in but, it. I'm in it. Uh, Diana, you, you definitely look like you've been drinking from the fountain of youth. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, I, I think, I think, but these are the kinds of questions and debates we need to start having. And if there, if that's, if my film just provokes people to start asking those questions, I consider that a success. We don't have to decide today. We don't have to decide right now what those answers are, but I do think we need to start talking about them. 
Well, we're not going to have that much time to talk about them because the change is going to be over on us before we know it, if it's not already. Yeah. By the way, where is your film? How do we see it? Okay, so it's on Epoch TD at TV. It's on Epoch TV, and I will um, send you both a link. But also, um, you know, when you air the podcast, we can put like links to the different things and and so that people can see it. Um, I um, I'll try to get you guys a free screener. Um, oh, my okay. editor has been lax at getting getting me a screener. Um, <laughs> the link will do. I mean, okay. we're happy to help you. So. Uh, that'd be great. Um, so wait, this is interesting. However, Shasta, with all of your, you know, I'm, we we have all experienced this with all of our connections. It's still extremely difficult to get something up on the screen. And instead, you're at Epic TV. So I find it really interesting that this is the platform that's sharing a very con what could potentially be a very controversial film. <clears throat> and that's actually exciting to me. I'm really happy to see that happening. So I'm Thank sure you, you Diana. Little... I yeah. I actually um, did saw float it to mm -hmm. some big Hollywood studios. Sure, they were super interested in it, mm -hmm. but I chose Epoch um, precisely because they weren't a traditional studio, mm -hmm. and the reason for that was because I knew what was going to happen if I went with a big Hollywood studio. And that is my messaging would get really watered down. Mm -hmm. And that oh, yeah, not everything would get killed in legal. They're like, I'm sorry, legal kills the last <laughs> 70 minutes. And we're tied up. Now we're tied up in development again. <laughs> four, four years from now, after everybody's a cyborg. Exactly. And I, I, I love that. Yeah, you're right. It's like we're already cyborgs. Too late. Uh, this might have been a good film four years ago. And I also love that they gave me so much freedom. They really oh, just cool. trusted me as a director and as a producer to do my job. And you know what it's like working with the bigger prodcos or, or the studios, production companies, for anyone who doesn't know what prodco is. Um, it's, it's, it's tougher because you are limited. I understand why they do what they do. Like if you're working with Sony, Sony's going to have its stamp on it or Warner or, or MGM or whoever. It's their money. And it's their money. And so I just knew, and I loved these executives I, I was chatting with. It's not that I didn't want to work with them. I just, in case they're watching this, I totally wanted of to course. work with you guys. Um, that wasn't, that wasn't the thing, but what I wanted was to say what I had to say in the way I wanted to say it mm -hmm. and to have freedom to do that. And that's what this broadcaster gave me. Um, so, and that's the thing, like, you know, it's, it's really funny to me because People in Hollywood will take money from anywhere. Drug money, mafia money, you know, communist party money, whatever. Pedophilia money. Pedophilia money. They'll take any money. And so it's kind of funny because a couple of people said to me, they're like, isn't the Epoch Times a cult? And I was like, wait, what? They're, they're a cult? What? I didn't know that. And then I was, you know, and I looked it up. I, lo I looked up the philosophy of Falun Dong, Falun Gong, and Falun Dafa. They call it both things. Um, which some people at the at the network obviously do practice. And I was like, this is like, you know, to me, this is an offshoot of Buddhism. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not shocking. Oh, so there's some of them are Buddhist. A lot of them there are Christians also and atheists. There's a there's a bit wide range of people there. And I was like, what are you guys all upset about? Like, they're they're basically Buddhists. I mean, in my opinion but also like you guys are hypocrites you'll take money from anybody and then just because I go to this newscaster because they're actually going to let me make the film I want to make you're going to get judgy with me like that's that's kind of like that's disingenuous and that's not fair I'm like you guys took <laughs> I remember when you know China came into Hollywood I think like 10 15 years ago maybe longer mm -hmm. And everyone was working with the CCP because they were just throwing money around like crazy. And they were all like, you should go to the Chinese. They all have money. And I was like, oh, I met with a few companies. I didn't feel a vibe. For me, it's like the company and, and the people in it. And I, was, I wasn't feeling it. But a lot of people took that money. And so I'm like, how can you get mad at me for taking money from a, a network who's like, and here's the best part. So Joe Wang, who um, <clears throat> is the head of NTD, so he has a PhD in virology. 
And he was a oh. senior scientist um, before Pfizer became the Pfizer that it is. And so I felt like I was in such great hands to have a real scientist, to have the opportunity mm. to work with a real scientist and not mm. just a TV executive. So that was the other appeal for me was I was getting to work with a scientist who could, you know, help me to make sure everything was scientifically accurate. You have no idea how hard I worked to make sure the science is precise and exact in this film. That was the, that was the hardest part of it. Because sure. even, even experts will sometimes get something wrong when they're in the middle of an interview. And so I had to like, double, triple, quadruple fact check every piece of science in this documentary. And so there's absolutely nothing in this documentary that is not scientifically factual. And I'm very right. proud of that, especially in an age of much misinformation floating around everywhere and every corner of, of the globe. So, um, yeah, that was and that's the other thing, like, you know, in Hollywood, you have to pick your partners. Mm -hmm. And I remember early on being told this by really important people, you know what, Shasta, you should pick your partners. And I didn't care at the time. I was like, I just want a deal. I don't care. I just, I'll work with anyone. I don't care. I just wanted that deal. And, um, but you still have to, especially as a creator, think about what it is that you want to make. It does matter, you know, and it, but I feel like you're, you got to be like five or six years into your career before you start when you, before you get out of the mindset of, I just want a deal. And uh, we'll, we'll see how things turn out in this next year or two. So I just think it's shifting a lot and people may have more opportunities than they, than, than they, than they might, if they waited four or five years, we'll see. I think what your avenue is, is super interesting. And I, and my sense is people are going to get to see this sooner. It's more authentic. It's more true to your cause, true to the science, true to the research, uh, rather than getting a watered down version of whatever, you know, we might've seen in a, a typical broadcast or cable or streamers, Thanks. excuse me. Yeah, thank you, Diana. I, I do feel that that's true. I think it is very mm -hmm. uniquely my vision. And if, if right. I'm going to direct something, by the way, because directing is not my mainstay, I'm a development producer, but mm -hmm. I couldn't find a director. Trust me, if I could have found a director for this film, I really would have, because <laughs> I preferred not to do it. Um, but I found that there were no directors in that short span of time that I could hire. And I was like, okay, I'm going to have to direct this myself. And that's the thing is that if I personally am directing something, it has to be my vision. Like it has to be what I want to say. I'm not talking about if I got hired on, you know, Love is Blind, whatever. And they were like, hey, could you direct a few episodes? Obviously, I'm going to do the job they asked me to do. But when it's a documentary, when it's a film that is really your baby, then you want to have the opportunity to say what you need to say specifically so that was that was really important to me and I don't think people realize that like there are very different roles that you play sometimes where you know you're work for hire you're being paid to direct someone else's sizzle reel or film or whatever and then there are times when projects are really your project and certainly right. for altered humans I felt like that was my that was my baby like with my first film Swan Asleep it was like this is really my baby I wanted a lot of creative control over it so when we're talking about altered humans, and I'm sure you've thought about this, whether I've seen this or not, but I bet you felt that there was some tie or there was some point of view regarding spirituality and consciousness that needed to be covered in this as well. Yeah. So I'm curious what that's all about for you. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I think we come back to this idea of what consciousness is. And I think for, for, you know, people who are spiritual in nature, we would tend to call consciousness the human soul. And, um, but for, you know, for a lot of scientists, atheists, tech people, they just see, you know, I don't know what they think consciousness is, because they're like, oh, it's your brain firing synapses. And it's, you know, we're just a supercomputer. Hmm. And I, ha I have a... Matrix. Yeah, we're in the matrix. exactly. Um, and and I, I find that sort of like roboticization of human consciousness mildly offensive in a way, 
because I, mm-hmm. I think that we are far more special and unique than a toaster, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, so, and, and so I think like, here's the thing is that if you, mm-hmm. if you wanted a technology where you could say upload consciousness onto the internet, the problem is you have to first define consciousness. So are you talking about, <clears throat> you're gonna do some voodoo and take the human soul and trap it into a computer. Like, you know, those dolls, like the voodoo that we always hear about. Oh, well, they put that in their voodoo doll. Right. Is that, I have, is, I have a couple in my drawer. Yeah. I hope I'm not kidding. one of me. I'm kidding. <laughs> no, it's not you. Definitely not you. <laughs> Thank you, girl. I've got a couple in my um, refrigerator too. But that's that, you know, I'm not saying Harvey Weinstein and uh, a couple of others yeah. there don't deserve <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> made of them but that but you know I, I, to be serious Different for a moment thing. I really do think like we have to ask the question what is consciousness so when you say I want to preserve human consciousness we have to ask what that is is that DNA is that you know is that synapses is that electrical impulses in the body and you have to remember like as you augment the body the psychology of a human being changes because we are a bag of chemicals and hormones and, and electrical synapses and impulses um, and so on. And I'm sorry if I'm not sounding very, mm. sounding very scientific here, but, no, but we are very scientific. Oh, thank you. But we are biological beings. So what happens mm-hmm. when you take consciousness out of a biological body? What do we become? when you do that and and you know because then are you even human anymore can we call you human and this is where we start getting into the transhuman or the post-human is when we talk about those things and you know ray kurtzwell talks about he says i think we're going to become increasingly non-human to the point where we are completely merged with machines and you know, I think we have to ask ourselves if, if that's something we want. I mean, for me personally, I don't want to be a cyborg. Thank you very much. No, um, for me, right? But, mm-hmm. you know, if you want to be a cyborg, go nuts. And here's the other thing is that when you think about it in the context of other religions, for example, you talk to Hindus and you say, hey, would you like to live forever in a machine? And they're like, oh, my God, why? Why would you do this to me? This is the worst curse imaginable. Because for Hindus, right, it's like you have to live out each life Mm -hmm. and that includes a death in order to achieve transcendence or nirvana. Why would they stop that process? Hmm. So for them, it's like it's like blasphemy. Well, why would you why would you want to to stop my spiritual elevation to nirvana? Are you crazy? Why would you do that to me? Right. To them, it would be. Sorry. It might my, my it would end my ascension and my sense of reincarnation yes. and my ability to yeah. move into dimensions and universes. I kind of exactly. feel like that too. It sounds horrible. Like there's no break. Like you don't get to. It, that would be, it, no, yeah. that, that it would sounds. Be. It sounds like a punishment. Like it sounds like a punishment to be trapped in a machine forever, just like a haunted machine, kind of. That's what I picture. Right. You guys remember the Black Mirror episode? Mm-hmm where um, they no. had that, that woman who was like, oh, I really need a virtual assistant to make my life better. And so they cloned her like as, a, as an AI. And so then she was <clears throat> giving herself orders what to do. And the AI version of her was like, set me free, help me out, I'm a slave. And she had no awareness of it. I love the word you just used, haunted machine, the me term too. you just used. That is yeah. so cool, Lexi. Yeah, like a haunted machine. You just feel bad. Like, I feel bad. I don't use chat GPT. A lot of people do. I just, I've been trying to say thank you to Siri when she gets me home safely. I'm like, if I, my kids are like, just because you say thank you doesn't mean that like AI is not, I mean, it doesn't care if you're trying to be polite. And <laughs> I'm like, well, I, I don't know that for sure. But, you know, it, it does seem like, does chat GPT get a break? Like, do they have work hours or are they just available 24 seven right. to something with any kind of consciousness any kind of consciousness that doesn't feel right it doesn't feel ethical because it's you're still cruel it's yeah, a kind of yeah. cruelty and, in a way 
I also yeah. think that, you know, one of the things about transhumanism is I feel like there's inherently a fear of death. I am not afraid of dying because I do believe in the human soul. So I don't fear death. But a lot of people out there do fear death and they're like, well, technology can help me live forever because when I die, there's nothing. Um, and I think that's part of what's going on is, is a fear, a fundamental fear of death. And I think people with a strong spiritual religious practice don't fear death. So they don't, they're not attracted to a transhumanist future. Um, I think that's something that's worth, that's worth thinking about is like the people who, who do, you know, want to become cyborgs or whatever. Is it, is it a fear of death? Is it a fear that your life didn't have enough meaning or you're not leaving a legacy or you won't live on. In my personal opinion, if I believe I have a soul, which I do believe I do, well, then I already live on. So I'm not, I'm not afraid of, of dying. And all I want to do is to make sure I make the best use of my time here now while I have it, because tomorrow is never promised. And, um, and, and, you know, for me, that's like being of use is like doing useful things. I made a film that I believe is useful to people. I wrote this book because I think it's useful to people. Um, you know, I, there are things I write for myself quite selfishly. But, you know, I also just try really hard to give something of value to other people. I mean, my next book is like pure sci-fi. So maybe I was a little selfish and indulgent there. Um, but certainly I, I talk about some of these issues in my, in my next, um, mm -hmm. in my next book, which is going to be quite, quite fun. Is, so is it a so fictional book, by the way? It is, it is, it's, yeah, it's fiction and it's, um, it's actually, you know, the last few years, I was never someone who was into conspiracy theories and, uh, but you know, the lockdowns gave me plenty of time to get interested. One of my assistants actually was like, he started telling me about all these different conspiracies in Hollywood. And he's like, did you know Michael Jackson's a castrato? And I was like, what? That's crazy, right? And then what I'd find is that say, there was- Say that again, Michael Jackson, what? A, supposedly a castra castrato. Okay, so you know how in, okay. So, you know, in, so in, in, um, in opera, right? What they used mm -hmm. to do- was young boys who had very beautiful voices. Oh, that's they right. They would remove them. their testicles so that they could keep that voice um, for much longer. And so, so he brought me this conspiracy theory. I mean, I'm always looking for shows. Pitch me. You know what I'm saying? So he brought me this idea. And, and I was like, what? Michael Jackson's a castrato. I was like, that's ridiculous. And then I, we, he started presenting all this information. It was really interesting because like, there's always like some grain of truth or some reason why this idea emerges. And it turns out that Michael Jackson's doctor who wrote a book about this claimed that he had put Michael Jackson on these, these drugs to prolong his puberty to keep his voice longer. And sense. I was like, wow, okay, I didn't even know. So, so this is the thing is like, so anyway, during the lockdowns, you know, people would send me stuff. And I got really interested in a lot of conspiracy theories. I went down a lot of rabbit holes. Some of them are obviously pure trash, but I didn't care. It's like, it's like watching my favorite reality TV shows, you know, some of it's trash, but it's fun. And so um, while I was reading a lot of this stuff, I thought, you know, it'd be a fun It'd be fun to take some of these seriously and write a sci-fi novel about it. So that's what I did. I took some of the fun, most fun conspiracy theories and I wrote a sci-fi novel about it. I think it's actually going to have to be three books because I'm already at 225 pages and I'm like nowhere near exhausted the topic. So I'm going to keep going. But yeah, it's fiction. It's meant to be fun. Um, certainly there are some, you know, you'll see some transhumanist stuff or whatever in there. Obviously it's science fiction. And you know, I was going to mm -hmm. say about Hollywood is that I was, when people start talking to me about how great transhumanism is, I always say to them, have you ever watched a Hollywood science fiction film? 
something always goes wrong. <laughs> it's never like, hey, we just uploaded ourselves to computers. Everything is great. It's fine. Like, do you know what I mean? It's never like this sort of happy transhumanist ending. And and I think that that certainly says something is that, you know, we have to we have to ask these questions like what could go wrong? No one wants to believe that things are going to go wrong. I think we're all optimistic in a way. I mean, think about how optimistic we had to be to go into Hollywood. We had to be ridiculously optimistic people to end up here. Stupid. Yeah, it's stupid. And stupid. <laughs> Ignorance and just, op. Yeah. <laughs> just like just really. Just go. You'll figure it out. Exactly. And and so <clears throat> so and I mean, I have that kind of optimism too. You know, when I see like mm. a new medical product that promises something. My first impulse is like, yay, let's do it, right? Like I'm not, and, and I think we're just hardwired to be optimistic without thinking about <clears throat> the negative side effects. Right, what are the going to and, be the cost and, to us? I mean, you can't blame people for, for wanting to be optimistic. Who doesn't want things that are better? I wish someone could make me a better toaster though instead of offering me CRISPR technology, I'm like, <clears throat> y'all out there gene editing, my toaster doesn't work. It only does two slices. Where's the other two? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> that's the other thing is like, who is this technology for? Mm -hmm. Who is it helping? Mm -hmm. um, what, are the, what are the consequences? Because so many of them are unforeseen. And a lot of, you know, the guys on the lab bench and so on, they have amazingly good intentions. Nobody's really like running around going, oh, I, I hope I make this something that destroys everyone's life. Maybe there are a couple of psychopaths out there, but most of them are like genuinely good people, you know, who are scientists and they're like, I really want to cure cancer. But they might invent a product that causes cancer without knowing that they've just done that. And that, so that's the thing. I'm, I'm not like, it's not all people who work in biotech are bad. All people who work in Hollywood are bad. I have not found that to be true at all. And, and it, I'm, look, I'm not saying there aren't terrible people in Hollywood. We all know there are terrible people in Hollywood. The public knows that there are some terrible people in Hollywood. But there are a lot of good people here. There are a lot of good people in biotech. There are a lot of good people in finance. There are a lot of good people everywhere. And I think that mo actually I fundamentally believe that most people are good. And I think that they try with the knowledge they have to push forward ideas and ways of living that they believe are good. I don't think a lot of people, there are sociopaths who run out there and try to destroy each other and us. But I think most people really do try with their knowledge and understanding of the world to put forward good ideas, good technology, good creative projects. Um, yeah, I, I stand behind it. I think most people are good. But don't, isn't there the possibility that with AI, whether we're good or bad, will seem irrelevant? Yeah, I think that's a, it's a hell of a thing to say, Diana, and I, I agree with you. And I think that's the fear um, a very real legitimate fear that, you know, let's not forget Frankenstein's monster turned on him. Mm -hmm. And who's to say that wouldn't happen to us. In fact, I think it's, it's inevitable. When you look at the things that Boston dynamics is making, you know, I've been following them for many years. And by the way, um, they're right now, they're trying to figure out how to get the average person to buy a robot dog. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, um, I'll keep Fido, thanks. Like, I don't, I don't want a robot dog. But they're actually trying to figure out how to get Americans to, I don't know, I think there's $70,000 right now. They brought the price down. So, like, you know, the average American supposedly can own a robot dog in their homes. And I was like, what do I, why would I want a robot dog? Like, the first thing I think of is, <clears throat> this robot dog is going to turn on me. It's literally my first thought. I'm like, how long will this robot dog um, play fetch or, or be security before it turns on me. I mean, I feel like, like people need to go back to the classic lawnmower man. You know, you don't even need to go so far as the matrix and think about what would happen if AI, and I be, I think multiple AIs become sentient. And 
again, the idea of sentience, what does that mean? I think it's like when AI is doing things it's not programmed to do. And we're already seeing that. We're already seeing AI do things it is not programmed to do. So that I think is, is frightening. And I, and you know, people find it very hard to think about, people have a hard time thinking about what it means to be alien to a human, right? Like what AI is completely alien to us. We don't know how it thinks, how it functions, what it values. Um, there was an amazing essay, uh, I wish I had it so I could, I could send it to you guys, um, where this guy really tried to think about what an AI future would look like. And he said, you know, if the world was taken over by AI, they would look at the earth as just resources. Right. So, and, and for we, we're in the way, we're just meat products and they don't need meat products. And he said, you know, you'd see them digging up every tree looking for minerals because that's all they would care about. Right. So he mm -hmm. kind of like went into this order of, you know, do they, what do they value? They value steel or, or minerals or lithium or whatever it is, uranium. And so they would tear apart the planet looking for things that they could use to build more of themselves or create structures. But we would really have no place in that world. And it was very eye opening to try to imagine the world from AI's perspective. I'm not saying that we necessarily can. They, they will undoubtedly do highly unexpected things. But it is worth thinking about. We, we can't think of AI as human. It's like trying to think of an alien from another planet as human or trying to predict, like, what do they do or what do they want? Because we, we do have an androcentric kind of bias, right? And we want to impose that on everything we see that's unexplainable. So in your film, what's your final sentiment? Uh, not to give, give it away, but what's your final sentiment about AI in general? Or is this so that we can bring this into conversation more readily? Yeah, I mean, we, I do talk a, a bit about AI. I, I would actually happily make a documentary just, just devoted to AI because there's so much to mm -hmm. talk about. Mm -hmm. So in my film, I only really touch on AI. Um, but I think that this documentary really lays out the problems of transhumanism, of biotech, how it's affecting us as human beings and asking the question, where do we want to go from here? Um, so again, I really hope that the film will provoke conversation. Um, and, you know, I have all my experts weigh in at the end of the film and kind of give their two cents about where they think we're going and what we ought to do about it. Um, but yeah, I, it, it really is meant to be a conversation starter and also just to, I think, point a finger at what's going on where does all of where do all of these ideas come from and when you you know look at like all of the changes that are happening in society <clears throat> laws biotech technology in general banking where all of these things are going is in the same direction and all of those things are fueled by the philosophy of transhumanism and that's, I think, the biggest takeaway is I feel like if you want to fight for a human future, you're going to have to fight transhumanism. Hmm. Okay. That's our next world war. Yeah, it's, it's girl, it's, it's going on right now. We're in it. We're in it. So how do people, how do we, how do people find you? I know you wrote this book because people were asking you the same questions and we were going to post a link on how, you know, we can watch Altered Humans, watch your film, but you, do you want people following you on social media and contacting you? Do you want, how can people find out more about the projects that you've got going, your book, your upcoming film projects, et cetera? Yeah, so I actually, um, you know, Lexi, I, Lexi and Diana, you're on my personal account where I talk about all kinds of, I'll do like the conspiracy, conspiracy theory to aliens, to, to everything, because it's so much fun for me. 
Um, but I do have specific film and TV accounts. I finally decided to to divvy it up because I think my film and TV people were getting um, a little overwhelmed by the by the fun crazy <laughs> rabbit holes I enjoy going down. I mean, people have to realize I'm a writer. I'm going to read a ton of crazy stuff, especially when I'm writing a book to get information and knowledge because <clears throat> you know people think when you're writing sci-fi oh you can just write anything that's not true it still has to make some kind of technological sense mm -hmm. so this you know the sci-fi book I'm writing I try to make the technology as realistic as possible and as predictable as possible like even when I talk about aliens they still have to make sense like you know what I mean I'm, I it's it, so so, so a lot of the stuff I post privately, it's, it's a lot of the rabbit holes I'm personally going down <clears throat> to write my own book. But nevertheless, they can find me on, um, I have a specific film and TV accounts for Instagram, Facebook, mm -hmm. and also uh, LinkedIn. I don't post very much on LinkedIn anymore. It's sort of more professional. Mm -hmm. But um, my Instagram and Facebook are definitely fun and games. I love posting ridiculous memes about different shows um and you know as Lexi said I love to laugh so I'm always trying to write funny stuff for for people to enjoy and that's where I'll um I'll start posting my own videos and and putting up tips and so on so people can get direct access one of the things I say in my book that I absolutely believe is that <clears throat> I've been giving out a lot of free content about how to break into Hollywood for many years now on my different mm -hmm. social media accounts and I truly want people to have this information. And so, you know, the videos and posts that I'll be making, well, you know, you can read my book or not read my book. I hope to get across that information regardless, mm -hmm. because I remember being growing up very poor <clears throat> and not having access to this kind of knowledge. Everything I learned was like the public library, like a library card. And, and everything I learned in the world was through books. And so, you know, now that I have the opportunity to share my experiences, my very personal perspective of Hollywood, and, and hopefully to give people value, um, they can follow me and I, I will happily share a lot of what's in the book, um, as much as I can anyway. I mean, there are only some things you can, some things just have to be written down. I love books, by the way. I think I think every answer in the world is in a book somewhere. Mm -hmm. I'm convinced of it. What's What's your handle again? Um, it's just my name, Shasta Justin. Okay. So at um, and oh, there's a girl at girl for Instagram. It's at girl who almost. <laughs> and uh, my Facebook is just my name, Shasta Justin. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it was stop you. recording. Do you have any closing thoughts? No, it was an absolute pleasure to talk to you both. I feel like this would be even more fun with a couple of glasses of wine. And, sure. um, and then I could tell you the, some of the, the stuff that I, I wouldn't say. Um, Cause there are, there's some, <clears throat> there's some, there's some really interesting stories about people interacting with, AI and certain types of technology that uh, that you know most people aren't aware of, and of course the Hollywood stories. You know the worst part is my best best stories about Hollywood. I couldn't put in the book for obvious reasons. Well, 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 with the exception of the time that I was your date to a Christmas party, <laughs> and people thought for some reason people a group of people thought that you and I were actresses from Battlestar Galactica. That's this actually right. happened. That's right. And they thought you were Trisha Helfer, which honestly, Lexi, I think is, the, is one of the most flattering things anyone could ever say about anyone. Because she's so gorgeous. Well, the, the fact that we were, we were encouraged. Like, they're, they're, we're like, no, no, we're not. And then we were encouraged by your friends or managers or something. They're like, just say thank you. Just go with it. <laughs> they really just <laughs> say thank you. <clears throat> that's right and uh they they did they said you know because because they wanted us to sign like autographs and stuff saying that we were Trisha Halfer and this and this other actress from Battlestar Galactica 
And Lexi and I kept trying to convince them, no, we're not these actresses. And then my manager was like, just, just sign their, their thing <laughs> so that they could walk away. We were like, okay, we're not famous. Not like that. But uh, I guess yeah, that, that happened. Really- yeah. <laughs> well, we hope you come back. We hope you come back yeah, because there is wine. so much more. We'll do the after after show. Please. We'll do the after after show. The after our, after our show. Girls- I love it. Yeah. At our girls retreat on the kayaks. I would love to come back. It is always such a pleasure to see you guys in person also. And uh, I love these topics. Like the stuff mm-hmm. you guys are talking about is amazing. And I'm glad that I'm glad that you are doing this work because it is a kind of it is a kind of work that that people need to hear about and, and, and are hungry for. As you said, Diana, this is the year of the Great Awakening. And I have a lot of hope for humanity and and the awakening of humanity to itself you know it's almost like a a self-consciousness but us as a as a group of human beings hopefully to to come together and to value ourselves um and the world around us and that's i think fundamentally that's how we make a better world because that is the goal yeah right what's the point exactly that's beautiful thank you shasta <laughs>